It must surely be the Syrian city that's been right at the heart of the country's tumultuous last 12 years. On the banks of the Euphrates River, in the north of the country, Raqqa was a major target for rebels opposed to President Bashar al-Assad in the 2011 Syrian revolution. It fell to them in 2013, but it wasn't long before the Islamic State group took over control. Then in 2014, ISIS declared its caliphate in Syria and Iraq, Raqqa the capital. Raqqa spent over three years under the Islamic State group, regularly pounded by Syrian, Russian and US jets. France also very much involved, announced as a retaliation for the 2015 terrorist attacks in Paris. I have decided to strengthen our actions and to target the Islamic State group in Syria, because we know it's this organization in Iraq and in Syria that organized and perpetrated the terrorist attacks in France. The city itself suffered as well from its occupiers, notably any non-Sunni religious buildings, including the Uyas al Qani shrine destroyed. It wasn't until October of 2017, following a long battle, that the Syrian Democratic Forces declared Raqqa liberated. Since then, much restoration has been carried out. Roads, bridges and vital buildings rebuilt, a teeming city once again. But huge problems persist with deep-seated animosity between the Kurdish and Arab populations, the fear of violent attacks from dormant cells of the Islamic State group, huge rises in the price of petrol and a real lack of water as well. Well, Chris Huby revisits Raqqa for France 24. Once the capital and headquarters of the Islamic State group, Raqqa is now bustling with life and keen to rediscover its heritage. Look here. This man proudly showing us the famous Baghdad Gate and the restoration efforts on the old city walls is called Sheikh Mohammed Noor al zaid These are old restorations and look, there are some mistakes in the original work. The Sheikh co-chairs the civil council that administers Raqqa under Kurdish authority. For the past five years, he's been working on the reconstruction of the city. This morning, he's concerned about the progress of work on the historic ramparts. That's the base of the wall. It's been badly damaged over time. And the whole structure has caved in. It dates from 727? Yes, since the reign of Abu Jafar al-Mansur. Despite support and commitment from the authorities, the restoration of this UNESCO World Heritage Site has fallen behind schedule. The Raqqa Civil Council Cultural Committee has begun restoration work and supplied the bricks. The reason for the delay in delivering the services is that the budget is higher than the resources allocated. Around 50% of the city still lies in ruins after the war with the Islamic State group. New construction projects keep being launched like the so-called new bridge spanning the river, which will allow heavy goods traffic to be re-established, essential for supplying this commercial city. This is a new borehole. It's a method that has been proven in several other countries. Down there, on the other hand, we're rebuilding using the old method. What we still have to do is install a pillar in the middle of the current here and rebuild the pillar over there that was destroyed. But the work being led by Ihab is also behind schedule. The war is again to blame. We had a lot of problems. First of all, there were a lot of mines in the water, under the bridge, especially those mines used to destroy pillars. We had to call in the authorities to clear them. More than a hundred mines had to be diffused, some buried up to eight meters deep.
Come here, look at this. You don't have to detach it, just push it 12 millimeters to this side. The biggest delays are being caused by the embargo and the so-called Caesar law. This law, passed by the United States and the EU, imposes sanctions on companies and individuals who trade with Syria. Due to the embargo, it hasn't been easy to import the machinery we need to work. Despite their limited resources and outdated equipment, Ihab's teams are due to deliver the new bridge in spring 2024. With the reconstruction of the city and the increasing number of building sites, Raqqa has been attracting thousands of displaced people, victims of the war and the jihadists. Here, they can find work and a modicum of security in a city under heavy Kurdish military surveillance. These workers are often very young, like 16-year-old Yusuf. I'm a mason. I cut the stones for the facades. I studied, but I had to give up. Now it's too late. I can't go back. So I found this job. What can you do? You have to work for a living. I'm learning this job so that I can be my own boss, God willing. Life is particularly difficult for these people. In order to survive, as is so often the case, this father has brought his children to work. My children have been working with me in construction for a year now. I had a bakery before and my children went to school. But because of the problems and needs we have, I had to bring them with me so they could learn the trade and help me. It's difficult, but I like this job. It's better than staying at home. And work is more important than school. I want to learn the trades and it's just better. At only 10 years old, Rami works nine hours a day, all week long and in non-existent safety conditions. According to the Save the Children organization, there are around 3,000, like him, toiling on Raqqa's building sites. There's another major project that the Civil Council is tackling in this city with few services, social reconstruction. The Oxygen Shabab Association helps ex-prisoners, namely the wives of jihadists, to reintegrate into society. My ex-husband was in the camp. He's going to register my daughter and put his name first. For your security and hers, it would be better if she's registered under your name. My daughter and my husband shouldn't stay together then. No, they shouldn't. Since 2018, almost 1,300 women have been released from the prison camps. Muna is one of them. This former English teacher now works for the association. I returned to the same neighborhood where I was in 2012. I knew everyone there. With a salary and a place to live, Muna's gradually becoming a Raqqa resident like everyone else. She says she feels like she's moved on from her past involvement with the Islamic State group. I've learnt my lesson. I'll never join another group again. All because of the suffering I went through and the fatigue. Even if the Islamic State group returned, I've made up my mind. The problem is that it wasn't my decision. It was my family and my husband who forced me into the Islamic State group. I was a victim. All the women here are victims. The women had no role. The husband decides everything. Thanks to this reintegration policy, 32-year-old Yasmin decided to open a small cosmetics and underwear shop. But she says it hasn't brought her much satisfaction. 
I'm too psychologically tired, and I struggle to support myself with this job. Either I deal with it or I don't. Twice married to foreign jihadists during the caliphate, her return to normal life has been complicated. I'd like to go where I don't know anyone and nobody knows me. It'll be better than living here, where we're supposed to be back home, but we are not welcome and we're always under suspicion. At least under the caliphate, I felt safe. Now there are problems of drugs, crime and burglars. None of that existed under the Islamic State group. Our only worry was the bombings. Now all we see is discrimination between Kurds and Arabs, displaced people and locals. All we feel is tension. Today, many Raqqa residents blame the current government for not doing enough to improve their living conditions. This is made even more critical by the fact that the number of people falling into poverty is growing, making the reconstruction efforts somewhat redundant. Here in Salat al-Banat, around 1,800 families live crammed together in extremely poor conditions. Rubbish trucks come here daily to unload waste from Raqqa, a few kilometers away. Why are they doing this? What have our children done? Yesterday they came with the rubbish truck. My child was playing there and the truck told him to move. They're deliberately trying to make us leave. What have we done to deserve this? Go this way. That's the way. Look, everyone here depends on rubbish bins. Even the cattle. Everyone lives off rubbish. Even the children live off rubbish. We're just looking for help, especially for the children. But there's nothing. We're just trying to survive. Can you tell me what you eat here? We eat flies, stuff anything we can find on the ground. And we live in these tents we've made from bits of plastic we found and tied together. I just arrived here. We collect nylon and plastic, all that we can to stay alive, our children and ourselves. Some of these families have been living here for over three years. Having found no work in Raqqa, they are left with only their children to help them survive. What do you do all day? From morning to night, they rummage through dozens of tons of rubbish looking for food and anything else they can sell on the streets of Raqqa. We collect bits of metal, plastic bags, cans. We just work to make a living. Due to the inflation that hit the whole region last September, these people have never been in such a precarious situation.
As we finish our reports, Rojava is suddenly faced with a new danger that threatens Raqqa. Turkey has just launched an attack on several towns and villages in Kurdish-controlled areas. Raqqa has been spared, but a huge protest march has been organized by the Kurdish authorities. There's a Turkish military escalation targeting civilians and infrastructure, electricity and water centers, aimed at paralyzing services in northeast Syria. We're afraid that the Turks will target us and kill us. I don't want that to happen. A new fear added to the poverty and heightened tensions between Raqqa's different populations, a combination raising fears that the Islamic State group may return. There are people here who support the Islamic State group, people who ensure we live in fear. Six years after the fall of the self-proclaimed Islamic State group Caliphate, the future of northeastern Syria still seems to be playing out in the streets of Raqqa. Chris Huby revisiting Raqqa for France 24. Well, that's all from this week's edition. Don't forget, of course, you can catch it and all the previous editions as well on the website at france24.com. More news coming up very shortly. Thanks for watching.